How are you guys doing? We're here live in West Yellowstone, ahead of Yellowstone Live tonight at 9, 8 Central on National Geographic Channel, National Geographic Wild. And we have some special guests we want to introduce to you guys ahead of the show. And here we have Nicole with the Montana Zoo, and she has a friend right here we'd like to introduce to you guys. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having us. Can you tell us about uh, this little slithery lady we have here? So this here is Mesa, and she is a gopher snake, otherwise known as a bull snake. Okay, and so is she from the Yellowstone Greater area, and where does she, you know, where, where's her habitat? Yes, she is. So, uh, bull snakes and gopher snakes, as I said, they're the same thing, can be actually be found within this region. They're very, very common to see. Uh, a lot of times they like open, arid areas, which are kind of like open grassland places. A lot of space where they can find their favorite food, which can th be things like gophers, mice, rats, animals, like that. And uh, what kind of animals are looking to, to snack on them? So their main predators are animals such as coyotes and uh, red-tailed hawks are commonly seen trying to get these guys. And um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below in the, in the comments and we'll try and get as many of them as answered as possible. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the story of how um, this little lady got to the zoo? Of course. So, Mesa came to us about seven years ago when she was surrendered as someone's pet. Um, fortunately, that happens quite a lot uh, to many of our snakes, that is why we have them, is because someone took them as a pet, which is perfectly fine. They're amazing animals to have as pets, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand the requirements to be able to take care of animals such as these and they get to a certain point and they realize that they're in over their head so they no longer want that animal anymore so fortunately for Mesa she was able to find a home with us at Zoo Montana and uh, what probably happened with her was that when she was bought she was very young within her first year only less than a foot long which is a really cute adorable snake at that time and now she is over four feet long which means a bigger enclosure, more food, and uh, the, the ability to be able to take care of a snake like that. And if you have, uh, what kind of advice do you have for anyone who may be looking to get a pet? Um, in order to get a snake, I would say research, research. Uh, that is probably one of the most important things that it is what happens with metals, snakes, other animals, is that people just don't put in the research into the care requirements for those animals. And if you do that, you'll be able to find the perfect match for you and what you're really looking for. And so we don't want to get her too overheated, so I'd say we move on to the next guest. Yes, we can definitely do that. I will unwrap her I'll from my you. arm. And can you tell the fans why uh, we're putting her into a pillowcase? Yes, the reason we are putting Mesa into a pillowcase is because that is to keep her nice and safe. Snakes are very well known for being really good escape artists and she does uh, like the comfort of the pillowcase as well. It allows her to be able to stay warm. It allows it to be dark, which makes her nice and comfortable. And with the pillowcase, we just tie a knot in it. We put it into a container, which we also then lock in place. That way, if she gets out of the pillowcase, she's not going to get out of her container. As I said, really good escape artist snakes are. And so to just let everyone know, this is something that isn't hurting her, just a, a place to make her comfortable, correct? Yes, that is correct. The uh, space actually makes her feel very, very comfortable and it allows her to feel safe as well. Um, some people are afraid of closed spaces. Snakes aren't actually that way this morning. When I picked her up, she was curled into a tiny little area about this big. So we're gonna move on from the gopher snake. Yep. And then we're gonna introduce our next friend. So uh, let's move on to that. And can you tell us what you're doing here as well? What I'm doing right now is I am putting some special water onto my hands and I'm going to apply some to yours. The reason I'm doing this is because our next animal is an amphibian. And amphibians are very different from reptiles, which is including our snake and our turtles. Amphibians include frogs, turtles, uh, frogs, toads, and this little guy right here, a salamander. This here is Ziggy, and he is our tiger salamander. And so you can tell us a little bit more about his habitat in, inside and outside of the park. Yes, of course. So inside the park, uh, there are actually very good recordings of tiger 
here south of the Lamar Valley, there is a very good population of them. Mm -hmm. And the reason uh, that they are there is because there is a lot of water. Amphibians need to be by water. That is why we put water on our hands. And so they will be found in ponds, slow moving streams, or what are called vernal pools, which are and then do they ever kind of journey out outside of the waters? They will. In order to be able to uh, lay their eggs, they will make migrations. Okay. So they will travel from one pool to another in order to lay their eggs. And that is actually roads. So during the breeding season for these animals, you uh, have to be very careful of watching the roads because they might be crossing, whether that be salamanders or toads or frogs even. Great. And do you think we can kind of show our fans a little bit closer? I mean, oh, you know, obviously. Lay them out not too far. Yeah. So can you tell a little bit, uh, the fans, a little bit more about how they got their name? So the reason that this is called the tiger salamander, as you can probably guess, is because of those striped markings on his back. They kind of look like the stripes of a tiger. And the coloration can vary a little bit throughout the region. This is actually one of the most wide-ranging uh, salamanders in the entirety of North America and with him he has the nice blotchy yellow and the black stripes but sometimes they can be almost all yellow or even a little bit more black. And so for our fans who are just joining us we, again we are in West Yellowstone ahead of Yellowstone live on Remember National that. Geographic Happy channel home. thank you and National Geographic Wild and we're introducing the Montana Zoo and we have Ziggy is his name, correct? Yes, that is Ziggy. And if you guys want to comment below with any questions, I will get to them as soon as I hand off Ziggy. But he is soft and he is smooth and he's cute. And I'll try and help give you guys a little bit better view of him. He's, I think he wants to come up and hang out <laughs> a bit. But there Ziggy is. I hope you guys can see him a bit. But he's just very relaxed. Mm -hmm. And looks like he's on a mission to Tad, so I will hand him off to you. He is Thank a, you so much. He is a very awesome salamander. Great. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of uh, the animals that he's preying on, how is, uh, what is he looking to eat for dinner? They are uh, very vicious predators. Uh, they will go after a wide variety of invertebrates, such as worms, slugs. They also go after bugs and sometimes... Uh, other animals that are living within their water environment, uh, they have, you might be able to see, they have that big, huge mouth, very good for gulping down large prey items, which mm. they definitely try to eat a lot of. And then in terms of, uh, you were talking about um, laying eggs, how many eggs did they lay at a time? Um, that is a good question. It can probably be about 50 to 100, sometimes even more eggs. Oh, wow. And their eggs do have to be laid in water. Being amphibians, they need to be able to lay the eggs in water because the uh, larvae are not the same as the adults. They are born looking very, very different. Uh, one of the best explanations I've heard of with describing a young salamander is thinking of Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon, mm -hmm. where he has those kind of flaps behind his head. They uh, have gills when they are born, and that is what they look like. And then wow. when they become adults, after metamorphosis, they then look like this, and they can come onto land. So we have a couple questions. Um, one may seem a little silly, but one asks, uh, are they poisonous? And are they? I, would, I would hope not, because we're holding on to them. <laughs> that is actually a really, really good question. So no, he is not poisonous, but the yellow and black markings can sometimes be viewed as a warning signal to predators. Sure. Usually bright colors in nature are not necessarily a good thing to try and eat. Yep. And so by having these colors, it not only might deter some predators, but it also really helps him to be able to uh, camouflage or hide within his environment. And so he's got these, this, this wide face and these small eyes. And we have another question to ask, uh, do they have teeth? Yes, they do have teeth. They have tiny, tiny little teeth within their mouth uh, that make a nice row to, for them to be able to get whatever prey items they want to be able to eat. All right, I say we move on to the to the next round. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Of course. And then we're saving uh, another slithery uh, guy for last. We have... One more time. So you Make sure he doesn't want to... 
dry out too much. And then again, guys, if you're just joining us, we're here in West Yellowstone, ahead of Yellowstone Live tonight at 9, 8 Central on National Ge Geographic Channel, National Geographic Wild. And you'll be able to see some of these guys later tonight on the, on the show. So make sure to tune in. It's going to be filmed live just right over there to the left off camera. But again, comment below with any questions and we'll get to as many as possible. And then so if you can introduce us into this last. Yes, indeed. We have another snake, but she's much, much different from the first one that we have. This here is Rachel. And you can probably tell right off the bat why she might get her name the rubber boa because she has very small scales and kind of flexible skin that give her a very rubber-like look and also because she can move her body looking just like rubber. She should be called a pretzel snake because she, she looks really like it right should. now. She really should. So we did have one question from YouTube before we get more into uh, the snake. Are, are these snakes native to this area? Yes, they are. All of the animals that you're seeing here today are found here in the greater Yellowstone region. And some of them are just a little bit easier to find than others. And uh, we have another couple questions. They're coming in hot. Can mm -hmm. all snakes swim? Can all snakes swim? Yes, all snakes technically can swim. That doesn't mean that they necessarily like being in the water. Um, ones like our gopher snake, if she needs to, she can swim just as well. Uh, but it's not like she's an aquatic snake. Snake. That one, uh, what co colors can boas be? What colors can boas be? So, one thing about is the color. It can be brown, it can kind of be an olive color, it can even be a little bit lighter. And then if I flip her over, you might notice that her belly is a different color. So that is another characteristic of rubber boas is that their bellies are usually much more of a creamier color. So I'm curious, is this full size? How, how old is this Bella? She is full size, and in fact, she is an old lady, okay. and she is about 15 years old, which is quite a good age for her, but she can live much longer uh, here in captivity. Uh, it is estimated that they could probably live thir uh, 30 to 50 years. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of their diets, are the both of the snakes, the gopher snake and the boa snake, kind of similar in the diets? No, they're a little bit different. While they both like eating rodents, uh, due to their size, it does make a big difference. So our gopher snake, Mesa, who you met earlier, she will go after things the size of gophers or rats. Rachel here cannot go after something like that. Even though snakes can open their heads much larger than it appears, uh, she mainly goes after smaller animals, such as baby mice. And uh, a lot of times they are known as nest raiders because of that. So we have another question for YouTube, and they're asking, are rubber boas rare? They are uncommon to find. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are rare. They're actually listed as uh, common within mm -hmm. the environment. The reason that you can't really find these animals as easily as, say, our uh, gopher snake is because our gopher snake is diurnal, which means she comes out during the daytime. Okay. These guys are nocturnal. They come out during the nighttime much more, and they can't take the heat as well as other snakes. So she'll often be found under logs or rocks or even within underground where it's a lot much cool. Uh, it's a lot cooler and much more moist for her, so that she doesn't have to worry about the heat. So for my couple of days being in West Yellowstone, it's been rainy, it's been cold, it's been gorgeous like today. What do they do when it's snowing out? They can actually go into hibernation during the winter time. So even though these animals are found up here during the winter time, our rubber boas can go into hibernation uh, so that they stay uh, perfectly healthy during the winter instead of facing the cold. And then in terms of the gearing up for that, um, you know, what is, what is their diet like that? What is their, I'm curious what their diet is on a day-to-day -day basis on a normal and then as they go into um, the winter. So an interesting thing about snakes is that they don't have to eat very much. Uh, our snakes here eat about once a week, but that's mm -hmm. because they're in captivity and we feed them on a very regular basis. She'll get probably a couple baby mice. Every single week our gopher snake will get one, whereas in the wild she could probably go for a couple months without eating wow. and be perfectly fine. A very interesting fact uh, is that their metabolism is much slower than ours, so they don't need to burn as much energy. So in all honesty, she could eat probably a few baby mice or a small mouse or something else and be able to withstand the winter time. 
diet, especially through hibernation. So they're skipping the all-you-can-eat buffet. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it's a hard world out there. The, the all-you-can-eat buffet doesn't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Nicole is here from the Montana Zoo. Make sure to join us tonight so you can join them on Yellowstone Live tonight at 9, 8 central on National Geographic Channel and National Geographic Wild.